media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks, his website RickAckerman.com. Welcome back to the show, Rick. Always a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on, Jim. Rick, the stock markets keep churning on. People keep asking, is the U.S. in recession? And so many people point to the stock market and say, how could it be? The stock market's still doing great. Could you be in recession? Yeah, there's a lot to be said for the uh, psychological support that this, the um, stock market, the bull market, gives to the economy. You know, we have a lot of... Uh, Pundits and economists out there saying, "Hey, look, the economy looks so strong uh, that uh, that just doesn't. There's no recession in the cards." What they fail to acknowledge is that, however strong the economy seems, it's really just a turn of the screw from recession. Because uh, when the stock market turns down, always for no apparent reason, at least initially, um, it, it it changes the psychological conditions that make everybody think that we're recession proof. Is there such a thing as being recession-proof? Well, history suggests not. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we've gone quite a long while without a recession, and uh, the stock market is well into year 11 here, so uh, you could almost get the impression that uh, it's never going to end, but of course it will. And it's not a, really a matter of earnings or, or f fundamentals, as it were, it's really just uh, a psychological condition that runs from extremes of exuberance to depths of despair. So we're, I think, pretty close to that uh, peak in exuberance right now. Retail sales in the U.S., uh, somebody said, oh, it, they must be great because Walgreens is doing well, and then other figures came in. What's the true state of affairs? There is no true state of affairs. You know, the uh, the news media hallucinates a new hallucination every day. And three days ago, we had, uh, or two days ago, in Wall Street Journal reports that Wall, Walgreens, no, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Walmart's robust sales indicate that consumers are still spending. Ain't that great? And that uh, this, this boded well for the Christmas, the holiday shopping season. Today, a couple days later, the lead story on page one in the journal uh, is under the headline, Retail Results Send Mixed Signals on Consumer Spending. So uh, this, this, apart from the, the schizophrenia of the news, it, it is important uh, what the psychological underpinnings are of consumption as we go into the holiday season because I think Oh, I can't remember the percentage of retail sales that occur over the Christmas holidays, but it's a very substantial piece of the retail picture for the USA. Is the likelihood of recession still there because the yield curve is no longer inverted? Well, um, the yield curve has been a pretty reliable indicator of, uh, of trouble in credit spreads, uh, some concerns in the financial markets, but also uh, a harbinger of an economic downturn. And the interesting thing is the Wall Street Journal had a headline out there or a story the other day that uh, said essentially that uh, we had this, that the yield curve was no longer inverted, so happy times are here again. But um, as Bob Hoy points out, once the yield curve has signaled and it, through an inversion that we've got trouble ahead, you can't undo the signal. So it's there even if uh, Wall Street is breathing a, uh, a an ill-timed sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, I don't know, so it, there was a, a scream in the dark, but just because they're not 
still screaming doesn't mean something bad hadn't happened. Right. It's like someone yelled fire in a crowded theater, and uh, and you know the, the usher comes in and says, "Don't worry, folks. Folks, everything's under control." And he leaves. And then you know the well. Anyway, uh, the, the danger is still there, and yes, uh, we will have a recession, although uh, we've avoided one for longer than, than most of us could have imagined. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, a lot of attention's been paid to gold over the past year. Is it still going to be a profitable venture? Um, I like gold here. I'm not going to say I love it like so many of my subscribers, but uh, I think they're, the undertone is firm uh, within a, a certain range, and the range can really uh, play havoc. You, you get into gold and you think this is it, only to see it settle back, but uh, I would say most of it has been consolidation. Um, the, the weakness is, uh, it feels like consolidation, but gold is in no hurry to blast off, and um, I don't see any great strength in gold uh, if the U.S. enters a, a recession and the stock market is down. I think that will bring gold mining stocks down as well. But uh, I do see gold as, as performing as an asset class well relative to all other investables over the longer term. Uh, on the energy front, is crude going to hold in there, or will it have its usual seasonal drop? Not in a global recession, and I think more than seasonal, it's uh, it's kind of secular. I'm looking here at the uh, December contract and let me give you some some good numbers we had a recent high in uh, crude up around 62 dollars and change currently trading 55 and a half that's the december crude um, i think uh, it, there's a good shot that it's going to come down to at least 52 and change and uh if it starts to snowball we could see on a barrel as low as $46.53. That's basis December. What other areas are you keeping a close eye on right now? Well, uh, certainly the uh, the bank stocks and the retailers, healthcare. Healthcare has had its uh, ups and downs depending on whether you believe that we're going to have socialized medicine or not. It's uh, it's one of those paradoxes, really, that sometimes the health sector goes bananas when we get when we get these indications that uh, that, that politically that we're, we're tilting towards socialized medicine because nothing's going to b- bankrupt us faster. But of course, if that somehow supports the healthcare industry, then then uh, then so be it. But uh, the, the financial stocks are looking. Pretty good. They always seem to figure out a way. If the trade deaths aren't happening, then maybe they get the IPOs going. But uh, there, there's always something that these guys can, uh, where they can make money. Uh, but uh, we've had some interesting peaks here. Goldman Sachs uh, currently trading around 220, could go to 235, but it's stalled in an interesting place that may have been a may turn out to be a significant top. So um watching the dollar as well because I'm I'm a very very long term very very bullish 
uh, very bullish on the dollar, and it's had uh, a pretty good correction, a pretty good lift also from early November. So it's hard to tell whether this is the beginning of a of a new major uptrend, but of course it will affect bonds. Um, and if you are a mortgage, a prospective mortgage borrower or looking to do a refi, I would suggest uh, holding off a little bit. The bonds have really taken a, a very nasty hit in, uh, let's see when, it, it, it actually started. The uh, bond prices topped out in August, late August, uh, at around uh, 165. They've come down to a recent low of um, around 155, so that's pretty substantial. And um, in terms of the 10-year note, that would account for a rise in rates on a 10-year from a low of around 1.43 to a recent high of uh, 1.8, 1.97. So we almost got to 2% on a 10-year, but um, I think that may be it for a while. So uh, I think we're going to be seeing e- interest rates ease up a little bit. And uh, you better get those really low late rates locked in because when Real estate, real estate starts deflating as it did during the 2007 and 8 period. Uh, even a 3% mortgage is going to feel like a crushing burden. Do you think the Fed's going to continue with its uh, rush to lower interest rates, and could the U.S. ever see negative rates? I don't think we'll go negative, but I would take them at their word, uh, which was, well, you know, we've we've uh, lowered rates three times, and the economy looks pretty good. We'll reconsider it. We'll revisit the problem if it if we see a problem. If the economy really starts to slow down, but but nothing should re- reassure us about that because by the time um, these uh, these governors, the Fed board, sees the economy in such condition, that they've got to start loosening again. Uh, you, you know that we're already in recession at that point. So uh, so I think the market. Wall Street has kind of used up its bullets as far as milking as much as they could from whatever the Fed was saying. And now, uh, even though the Fed doesn't so much intend it, as uh, they basically said, hey, you guys are on your own now. Uh, We can't give you much help. Everybody expects help if it's needed. But again, the important thing is the Fed's not going to recognize a situation requiring help until it's too far advanced. Uh, for lower rates to do any good. Do people confuse uh, the Fed's set rate and the real interest rate? No, no, there's no confusion. I mean, we know what it costs to borrow on for, for mortgage or on a credit card or whatever. We know the big guys get their money more or less for free, and that's how the system works. I think everybody's pretty adjusted to that. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, why do people keep pouring money into companies like Tesla, or Uber companies that have never made money, or if they have, uh, it was briefly. Well, the, most of, I wouldn't say pouring so much as panicking, and the only real panic we see is short covering. So uh, that's the source of that, that's the only source of buying capable of pushing um, uh, stocks through previous highs through resistance. You don't you bulls don't do that bulls. Bulls are never so enthused about stocks that they can uh, that, that, that investors have the guts to push above a previous high. So it's all short covering. And a case of in the case of Tesla, 
I mean, they really, <laughs> boy, did they pull a rabbit out of the hat. You know, if you you were on my website, I've got one guy who used to come after Tesla with the meat axe every day. He was saying, oh, you know, Musk is a criminal and this and that. Personally, I love Musk. He's a real hero of mine. And unlike all the, the numbnuts at, uh, at uh, all, the, all the portfolio managers who simply throw other people's money at, at stocks, at companies that don't do anything, uh, companies that exist simply as applications in the cloud, like uh, Uber for one, no capital investment there. Um, compared to all those, and even the, the big ad, ad agencies like Facebook and Google, compared to all them, Tesla's the real deal. They turn out a car that's fast and beautiful, so you got to love Musk. But at, when the stock was uh, bottoming back there in uh, in late June, early July, down around 180 off a high of 380, you would have thought they were dead in the water. They were not going to be able to service their bonds and the, the lenders were going to close them down and this and that. And things look so grim for Tesla. But since then, it's gone from 180 to, as we speak, 359. So it's had, it's doubled. And that's, that's only since, uh, since June. And, uh, most of it has been on, uh, a short squeeze that occurred back in, uh, let's see, it was, uh, late October. On October 24th, uh, Tesla had a huge gap from 250 something to around two, uh, 290 something. And it was all short covering. Nobody expected Tesla to say, hey, we're meeting our numbers on deliveries and revenues are good and this or that. So, so that's all it is. It's driven Tesla, uh, crazy and it's all short squeeze, but I can only uh, wish Musk well and hope hope they survive. You see Teslas everywhere you, you you go now. They're not just hot cars for the rich rich. They're they've kind of trickled down into the uh, sedan buyer category. So um, so uh, so anyway, to, to get back to your question, they throw money at stocks because they're short them like crazy. Uber, the only chance Uber has of rallying, Uber's never going to make a dime. Um, uh, never. And, and the amazing thing is that Uber still distracts the idiots, the people who bring us the news, the Wall Street Journal, all the analysts. It still distracts us or, or would have us distracted by, you know, this talk about, well, we're going to do it in food deliveries and driverless cars. So all, all the stories that drive these companies are just twaddle and they are meant to sort of get long term buying, a little bit of support so that whenever there's some sort of tone change that's ostensibly bullish, they can short squeeze the stock. So you can bet that that's what, what they're waiting for in Uber. Uber traded as high as 48 back uh, last summer, and now it's trading 27. So it's just been down, 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 but it looks to me like it's kind of biding its time, uh, waiting for some sort of short-covering panic to push it up to the point where the analysts can start all that blather about why the stock has moved, they'll give us a bunch of reasons. But, but if they say that one of them is that Uber is going to start making money, uh, you can you can throw that out. And and I know that because I, I have had many rides with a guy who thought he was going to be Uber, he was going to beat Uber and Lyft at their own game. And, and he was accumulating a pretty good list of, uh, of private customers. And... Uh, and He's decided to stay in the system, really, because even though he works 70 hours a week, it's uh, it's hard enough for him to make money. And uh, bottom line, the only way Uber and Lyft will ever make money is to is to squeeze it out of the drivers. And trust me, the drivers are already squeezed enough, so there's no there's no give in the system. And and they've sort of tried to they try to game the system that the drivers all do these little tricks that boost their income. They'll drop you off at the airport, and before they turn down the flag, so to speak, they'll, they'll make two or three laps around the airport uh, after they've dropped you off, and they get paid. They also get paid for showing up, and if they don't see you within three minutes, they, they're free to go, and they get paid anyway. They get paid uh, a few bucks um, for uh, for a non-pickup, and they they play a game, really, to do that, um, Uber could could defuse that. They could negate it right away 
by using the GPS to know exactly where the drivers are and when the drivers are actually turkeying the Uber itself. But uh, but they don't because they know that if they push any harder at all on the drivers, they're going to have a revolt. So I, I, know, I know that was more answer than you were looking for, but, but as far as why investors throw money at junk, they love junk because that that's what sells. So you can't you can't sell you can't sell earnings. You can only sell a story about how fabulous earnings are going to come. So uh, earnings are a curse. So it's always better to have a company that doesn't make anything. I wonder if they broke out the Oompa bands in Germany. Their uh, GDP went up a point one percent in the third quarter, meaning. Officially, they avoided recession. Is there any re- reason to celebrate, really, there? I, th- I think there is. I think that uh, in the next quarter, France is going to order a zillion Mercedes Benzes, and and the German economy is going to boom. Uh, obviously, I'm kidding. You know, Europe uh, has th- th- there's not a prayer there, and uh, Germany, uh, the ostensible engine of, of economic engine of Europe, uh, they're having trouble just sort of chugging up their own hill there. Um, so, um, and and Germany, true to its what, what it learned from the 1921-23 uh, hyperinflation, it never wants to go in the direction of monetization. Germany's just not a, a, a QE con- country. And um, so Europe was basically saying, well, you know, we, we've uh, we've shot everything we can with uh, with monetization. Uh, we were already at uh, negative interest rates. Germany, can't you do something in the way of fiscal stimulus? Meaning, Germany should pull out all the stops and uh, and spend a great deal more than it is taking in, and that might somehow drag all of Europe uh, up with it. But uh, Germany rejected that option, so. Um, as far as this one tenth of one percent uptick, I don't think I'd read too much into it. Of course, uh, Germany's solution to the Great Recession eleven years ago was to offer ten thousand dollars to anyone who bought a new car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm waiting for that deal here. <laughs> that's that's great. The Germans um, to give them their their due. Whenever they had a chance to, to sleaze out like the rest of the world does where money is concerned, you know, all sovereign entities that can print money, they, they always do when they have to, when they, even when they don't have to. So in Germany's case, you know, when they integrated East Germany, they had the option of, of inflating like crazy to pump some, some life into East Germany's economy just to kind of uh, jump start it. But instead, they did the exact deflationary opposite. They they said we are going to redeem every Ostmark at, at a one to one at parity with with uh, the D mark, and uh, it was amazing that they could do that. They could say we're going to bring East Germany back in the game the honest way. We're, we're going to pay for it, and we're not going to pretend that we bailed them out of debt and this and that. They'll have to earn their way back, and so so Germany. Did that at enormous cost. They're doing the same thing with energy. They basically said no more nuclear power, um, and they're going all in a direction of uh, wind and solar that makes Germany maybe the high cost producer of energy in the whole world. It costs German manufacturers more to buy power than than uh, in any other country. So they're they they just they keep more more honest books than any other country in the world. And uh, you got to give them credit for that, but I don't think it, it, it's it, it's going to be impossible for them to pull Europe out of a tailspin. Rick, anything else you'd like to add to this week's show? Well, I think we've covered a lot of territory there. I don't know if we mentioned uh, I mentioned this earlier, but but um, everything the e the S and P's, the minis, uh, the Nasdaq Composite, the uh, the um, uh, industrial average, they have all hit target resistance, some of which I've been drum rolling for months and months and months, and they all hit it within the last couple of days. So uh, I'm very cautious here. Uh, this could be a major top that we've seen yesterday, today, and uh, that's kind of what I'm looking for, but not quite expecting because the, this 
market, bull market has been, it's uh, almost in uh, at year 11 or well into year 11. And uh, if it pops through, if it pops, all these broad stock indexes pop through trend lines and my hidden pivot target for the next couple of weeks, I would read that as absolute lunacy, but I wouldn't get in the way of it. It, it would, it would, to me, if, if the Dow pops above the levels, it just keeps going. Next week and a week after, we're going to Dow thirty thousand for sure. Rick, thank you so much for chatting with us. Always a pleasure. I appreciate your asking me on, Jim. My guest has been Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks. His website rickackerman.com. If you have any questions for Rick or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.